Okay, so you may know I have a different background. I um, kept noticing that my internet kept freezing on my other videos, so I'm trying to school. We'll see if I get interrupted here. All right, so this is the last part of chapter two, part three and four. I apologize, this is gonna be a little longer. So we talked about covalent and ionic bonds and hydrogen bonds, and we talked about how hydrogen bonds um, are going to make liquid water cohesive. And so we talk about water, remember water is polar, has that oxygen, in fact, if I draw it, has that oxygen with the two hydrogens and it's pulling the electrons closer. So it's got um, one end is partially negative, one end is partially positive. So what happens is those water molecules stick to one another because they're attracted to those opposite charges. Water sticking to water is called cohesion. So we have here, right here, we can see the water with the dotted hydrogen bond sticking. There's another one right here. That's cohesion. Now we also have other substances that have hydrogen bonds because of that, that uneven electronegativity. And so we can see here, this protein is attracted. Ooh, let me do a different color. This protein is hydrogen bonding with the, with the water. And so that is two different types of uh, substances. And so we call that adhesion. So water with water is cohesion. Water with something else is adhesion. And so this property makes water very cohesive. It gives it um, the stickiness, you could say. And so we have this thing called surface tension. And so we have, if you've ever taken a paper clip and floated it on top of um, a glass of water on the water surface, you can um, see that that's called surface tension. I have a video, I'm not gonna show it right now, but I would watch it. You can, if you go into the PowerPoint and hit the play, I also think I have this video also in uh, Canvas. It's really kind of cool and it shows water in outer space. It's not that long of a video, I'd highly suggest watching it. And so um, this also allows for certain insects to walk on water. Um, so this high surface tension that we see on water. Some of you guys may have actually taken it and they show that in the video where you've done so many drops of water on a coin and you can get a ton of water droplets. You wouldn't think you, you could, but you do. Because these hydrogen bonds tend to resist temperature change, water is a great moderator of temperature. It helps to regulate your temperature. Matter of fact, that is the best thing is to be well hydrated in the winter because if, the, if you're well hydrated, it helps you maintain your body temperature better and in the summer, in both extremes. So heat is, um, heat is energy associated with movements of atoms and molecules and matter. Temperature measures the intensity of heat. So heat is released. So when we break, when hydrogen bonds form, when they make, we're, we're lowering our energy state. And so we're giving off energy. When To break them, we have to put in energy. And that's why with boiling water, you gotta put so much energy in there to get water to boil because they have to break those hydrogen bonds between all of those molecules of water in order to be released from a liquid to a gas. When a substance evaporates, the surface of the liquid that remains behind cools down in a process called evaporative cooling. And you can think about when you sweat, and that is how sweat works. As you're heating the, the liquid on the surface of your skin, it is absorbing the heat from your body and going from a liquid to a gas, and that is cooling you off. It is called evaporative cooling. Um, I have a little video here, which is kind of um, entertaining. It's also a little short video on how sweat works and some interesting facts about sweat. Ooh, and this is what happens when you touch one of the pictures in the new PowerPoints. And now I can't get my thing to flip. Ah, there we go. Okay. So ice. Ice is less dense than liquid water. So we know that water can exist as a gas, liquid, solid. It's kind of one of the weird things that we actually have names for each one. We call it steam, water, and ice. As water freezes, it, it, most things, as they get colder, they get closer together. 
water gets further apart. What happens is because of those opposite charges on that molecule, we want to make sure we have the positives and the negatives and the positives and the negatives instead of two positives together. So we spread out and we maximize the number of hydrogen bonds. So we get organized. And in order to organize that and to maximize hydrogen bonds, we have to spread out. And so this causes the density to go down. And this is why when you put your pop in the freezer, it explodes because as that water expands, as it's going from a liquid to a solid, it, 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 the can can't hold that pressure, right? So as ice crystals form, like I said, the molecules are less densely packed. This is also why ice floats, right? Because ice is less dense than water. Here's a picture of this. You can see all these hydrogen bonds and how it's like what we call crystalline structure. We get nice and organized. And so we're spreading out and this causes our density to go down versus here. As a liquid, those water molecules are moving back and forth. And yes, you may have a positive with a positive and a negative and a negative, but it's very quick interaction as they're moving around. They don't wanna be stuck by each other in a solid state. So we're gonna spread out and we can see here this picture of this ice floating on the water. And we see that now as we look outside. A solution is a liquid consisting of a uniform mixture of two or more substance. So I have my solution and I can talk about my pop again. We know that every sip that I am going to take is going to hopefully taste the same. Unless I freeze it, then you get that slush. So the dissolving agent is called the solvent. Most solvents are water. Most things that we try to dissolve into are water soluble. What we're trying to dissolve into it. So in this case, you know, my pop again, I'm dissolving a lot of sugar into it and other chemicals that are probably very good for me. Um, when it is, when a solute is in water, we call it an aqueous solution, right? Um, Water's versatility as a solvent results because of its polarity. And well, you know, I'm always going to say likes dissolve, likes polar dissolves polar, nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. Most things are polar or ionic that we deal with. So again, ionic is just basically polar on steroids, right? It's super polar. And so what happens is that they will easily dissolve. And you guys do that. You put table salt into water and it falls apart. Here's a picture of this. So when we take our, our sugar, our sugar work the same way, but we take our salt, we can see how the salt, the positive ion is going to be surrounded by the negative end of water. Chlorine's the negative ion. It's going to be surrounded by the positive end of water. Eventually what happens is if you put too much salt in there, we do not have any more available bonding sites with water. And so it will, it will not dissolve. It'll stay with its partner in its nice little cube of salt. So, or if you've ever then evaporated the water off, you get the salt back. It stays at the bottom of the container. Okay. So again, most stable state. All right. So right here, we're nice and we are meeting octet by, by um, sharing in our covalent bonds. But in this case, we're helping cope with the negative and positive interactions that are going on. So we got a couple different things going on. So these are attractive forces. In an aqueous solution, a small percentage of water breaks down into ions. So what we're saying is water can break down into OH negative plus an H plus. So it basically, this is called a proton. Because remember hydrogen? Oh, why did I write a K? Hydrogen equals one proton and one electron. And what happens here is this, this oxygen rips the electron off this hydrogen. And so we're stuck with a proton. And so when we have a high proton or H plus, we can call them a hydrogen ion concentration. This becomes an acid. When we have a high OH negative or hydroxide ion, that is a base. 
A lot of people are worried about acids. Bases can be just as bad. So again, a compound that releases H plus in solution, like I said, is an acid. And then we can also say that because an OH negative will accept that proton to form water. And so that could be another definition for a base. So the pH scale um, is on a scale from zero to 14 with, I have a picture here, with seven being neutral. As we go bigger up, higher in our numbers, that's a base. As we go lower, it's an acid. Um, another word for base is alkaline. So when you hear about things being alkaline, they're referring to being basic. Now this scale is logarithmic. So if I go from a four to a five, these are differences. Like if I go from five to four, I have a I have 10 times more H pluses. If I go from a five to a three, I'm gonna have a hundred times more H pluses. So it goes up by a factor of 10. That's what that logarithmic means. And like I said, zero, we have our neutral, we have our alkaline, we have our acid. And we can see how these different household substances and stuff compare on our pH scale. So again, here we have a picture of our acids and bases. So again, the acids have more H pluses, the bases have more OH negatives. One of our first labs that we're gonna be doing has to do, remember, with acids and antacids. So they are gonna counteract that acidic. So generally they are bases. A buffer is a substance that minimizes the pH. So when we use buffers, buffers can either accept or donate protons. And so they can help to keep the pH at a certain level. It is really important you know, if we think about, let's go back here. I mean, think about the things that we drink that are acidic. A lot of us have lemon juice or grapefruit juice or tomato juice, or I'm drinking all my soda and I drink a lot of black coffee. These things are all really acidic. And so I don't want to eat something that's acidic and then turn my blood acidic. So we have a lot of um, help with these buffers in our body to prevent that. One of which is, when we talk about um, bicarbonate ion, and this bicarbonate ion, believe it or not, is a combination of water and CO2. And we have plenty of carbon dioxide available, and we'll talk about where that comes from when we talk about cellular respiration. And so this substance here can go one way and give off our protons, or it can go the other way and accept them and turn them into water. Okay. So depending on which way we need to move our pH, it can go to the right or it can go to the left. So um, your book talks about some of these because many of you guys are going into anatomy and physiology. And so when we talk about homeostatic, remember homeostasis means balance. So when we lose balance of, as of acids and bases, we could get what a situation is called respiratory acidosis. And this causes, this is where, again, you, you're too acidic and you have problems breathing. Metabolic acidosis is problems that reduce level or functions of buffers that act. So this is where we're not producing those substances that should be act, acting as buffers. And so we have a problem with this. Usually respiratory acidosis results from hyperventilating. And so we just need to breathe in a bag um, to, to correct that problem. So if you've ever had somebody hyperventilate. So here are some mechanisms of meta metabolic acidosis. So again, if your kidneys, your kidneys are great for um, maintaining the proper pH of your blood. And so if your kidneys aren't working correctly, that would be problematic. Again, maybe you're losing bicarbonate ions for some reason. And usually again, that's from the kidneys or the bowels. So excess diarrhea. So we have problems with both the um, excretion and um, elimination. And then we also have um, 
keto acids, diabetic ketoacidosis. So we talk about um, different types of strong acids to the addition when you're adding strong acids to the body. Um, a lot of people worry about particular diets because uh, especially if you're eating a diet that's full of fats, that fatty acid, and they talk about going into ketosis um, in order to burn those fats, which is what we're trying to do when we're losing weight, we're losing weight. So we have to be careful with that process. And then we have um, alkalo alkalosis, which is where it becomes too basic. And this is respiratory um, difficulties that cause carbon dioxide levels to fall too low. So what happens is, again, if you're hyperventilating, you're usually taking in a lot more oxygen and you're not getting rid of the CO2. Our body regulates breathing, not by our level of oxygen, but by the level of CO2. We have CO2 receptors. And so when that becomes unbalanced, um, it, it messes with the pH in your blood. So again, it's, uh, uh, our respiration is very, very important, whether we're holding our breath or whether we're breathing too fast. And again, we have here metabolic that's generated from prolonged, um, or severe vomiting. So not being able to keep your food down. So then I kind of have like this little summary here, a metabolic, um, alkalosis, of that basic metabolic basic. So again, if we have our bicarbonate ion is increased, um, we could have loss of chloride ions. I am not going to ask you really hardly any questions over this. I just put this here because it's in the book and they're trying to prepare you for anatomy and physiology. So in this case, your pH goes up, your bicarbonate levels go up. Um, and so we have these issues that is compensated by breathing. If you suppress this, uh, breathing is suppressed to hold the CO2. We want to hold the CO2 and keep them in. We conserve those protons or hydrogen ions, or we're going to eliminate the um, bicarbonate ion in the urine and the urine is basic. So we know that that's one of the tests they do when you have certain problems is they'll test the pH of your urine so they can identify whether A, you've got some kind of metabolic alkalosis going on, or you might just simply have a bladder infection. So um, that can tend to mess with the pH as well. So I kind of have a comparative slide here. So again, metabolic acidosis, the bicarbonate ion goes down, um, metabolic alkalosis, it goes up. And then we have our PA is per Pascal. Um, that's basically pressure. So again, if our CO2 levels go high, we form more carbonic acid. If it goes low, then it becomes more basic. And so we, we have both these metabolic and respiratory situations. So again, I'm, I'm just trying to prepare you for AMP. And that is, and that's what you're going to find in this book. We're going to have each chapter is going to try to relate at the end of the chapter or relate to some kind of principle that you're going to learn in anatomy and physiology. And so um, you should, you need to get used to that because again, this class is to prepare you for that course. That course is also going to bring up topics that you learned in bio 123. So it's really important that you learn these topics here. And in conclusion, then we have all of these topics that you should be able to do by now. So you should be able to define matter. You should be able to tell me about what different elements, the PENs, right? Protons, electrons, neutrons. You should talk about the different types of bonds, uh, hydrogen bonding, characteristics of water, pH, and buffers. So those are all topics that you should know for the chapter to portion of your test. All right, again, like always, if you have any questions, please feel free to um, get in touch with me or even ask me while we're in lab. All right, I will talk to you later or see you later.